Hello everybody, this is Madam Morbid and today we are going to talk about the very sad and tragic case of Nancy Cruzan. Nancy Cruzan was 25 years old. She was born in 1957. She was the daughter of Joe and Joyce Cruzan. They were from Carterville, Missouri. Nancy graduated in the 1975 class at Webb City High School. She was married. She had two sisters, Donna and Christy. Christy had two daughters, her nieces, who in 1983 were 10 and 8 years old. This is Schreiber Foods and this is where Nancy was working in 1983. She left here when her shift got over and her accident was sometime after midnight. So I don't know if she got off work at midnight, but we're going to drive over to Elm Street, which is where I read in one newspaper article that her accident was. While I don't know for sure if this is the exact route she would have taken, it is, according to my GPS, the most direct way. So it's very possible that this is the way she would have gone. It was January 11th. It was icy, wintry weather. It would not have taken much to cause an accident if ice is involved. A policeman found Nancy somewhere along this road in a ditch. I don't know if a neighbor saw the accident and called it in. I don't know how they found her, but her brain went without oxygen for about 30 minutes. So that may be how long it took the police to find her. He thought she was dead. He was able to do CPR and get her breathing again. They got her to the hospital. From what I've read with brain injuries like what she had, they usually know whether someone will recover within the first one to three months. They hoped she would get better. So on February 8th, her family authorized the insertion of a feeding tube. She was breathing on her own, so the only thing that was sustaining her was this feeding tube. This is the Missouri Rehabilitation Hospital. This is where Nancy was on hospice. It was founded in 1907 as a tuberculosis hospital. Tuberculosis at the time was called the White Plague, and if you were diagnosed with it, you were pretty much going to die. The question was, how long? The only treatment they knew of was rest, fresh air, good food, and because it was so communicable, people who had this were separated from society and put into institutions like this. And so Missouri decided to appropriate $50,000 to build the sanitarium. They chose Mount Vernon as the site for it. It was a good location, it had access to water, it had room to expand. So the city offered them 60 acres, they donated $3,000 for it, and Mount Vernon promised to give the facility water, electricity. The original facility had 12 buildings. But in the 1950s, tuberculosis became easier to control. There were better treatments. It was easier to diagnose. The number of patients decreased. They expanded what the hospital treated to just be chest ailments in general. And it was around this time that a lot of the original buildings were torn down and they built new, more modern facilities. In 1971, they expanded it further to where they would treat cardiac issues as well. In 1983, the Missouri General Assembly changed the facility's name and changed its mission again. Now it would be used to treat people who had been seriously hurt in an accident or who had been injured, but had the capacity possibly to recover through intensive rehabilitation. This is when it became the Missouri Rehabilitation Center. And this is exactly when Nancy Cruzan was placed into this facility, initially hoping that she would recover. And sadly, her brain so damaged that there was no way she was going to recover. Nancy lived like this for five years. She could have been kept alive with this intervention for decades. But after five years of this and knowing their daughter would never come back, Nancy's family asked to have her feeding tube removed so that they could let her go. Their daughter was gone. People 
in Nancy's condition need to have a physical therapist moving their limbs every single day. That was not done for her. And so Nancy's limbs were permanently clawed. She was not conscious in any way. People in a vegetative state like this, their eyes may move at a sound. But from what I've read from doctors, this is literally just a reflex. They are not aware of anything going on around them, despite the fact that their eyes can be open, but really they are the same as anyone who's in a coma with their eyes closed, unable to respond. And basically what ended up happening is the hospital refused to do this at the family's request. It bothered staff. They didn't want to have anything to do with killing a patient, essentially. It's what it felt like to them when really it was just withdrawing care and just letting what should have happened the night of the accident happen. He said, we can't do that without a court order. So in 1988, Nancy's parents went to the, the circuit court, said that yes, and gave her parents permission to remove the feeding tube. It was appealed by the state of Missouri. It went to the Missouri Supreme Court. They reversed the decision. You cannot remove her feeding tube because she has not given her consent. Therefore, her parents cannot make that decision for her. Nancy's parents appealed again. And in December of 1989, the Supreme Court took up Nancy's case. The first time ever that the Supreme Court of the United States took up a right to die case. They ended up ruling that Nancy's parents did not have the right to make this decision for her. Basically what this case led to was people, when they are able to make decisions for themselves, must make their wishes known to their families because this ruling basically said, unless you do that, your family is not authorized to make that decision to withhold treatment as you would want. I read a lot of opinion pieces about this case. It, for some people, it was murder. For others, it was mercy. For some people, what bothered them was, so the state of Missouri thinks they know better than a, a person's loved ones. At the same time, though, a lot of people were extremely supportive of the Cruzan family. There was one article about the people of Cartersville who were just so supportive and empathetic to the the horrible things the family was going through. I was pretty surprised by how much support I was finding for them. At first, Nancy's doctor was against unhooking her from her feeding tube, but as time passed, he did change his mind and he said, I would never want to live like this myself. The way her hands and feet were all curled in on themselves, uh, she basically had to lay in the fetal position. And of course, none of these courts who made any of these decisions about her fate ever saw her. And uh, you know, one of the pieces I read said, if they had wheeled her in, to that Supreme Court chamber and let them see her the way she was living, they may have made a completely different decision. And it was absolute torture for this poor woman's family. And they were drugged through the mud. People were judging them. They were accusing them of wanting to murder their daughter. They had nothing to gain from it except closure to let her go. One guy in, in an article, he had a loved one living in a vegetative state and he basically said it's a funeral every day. You go to their bedside and every day it's like they die all over again. They're laying in front of you and they're just gone. There was a woman whose mother was like that and she hated to see her mom like that but she just couldn't let her go the way you were required by law to do it. She could not let her mom starve to death. So I totally see both sides of this argument, how hard it is to bring yourself to do it, to have to watch it happen, to accept that they're gone. After this ruling, her family did rally, and what ended up happening is she had shared her wishes with a roommate, with someone she used to work with. These people came forward, they testified what Nancy had told them. The courts finally gave her family permission to unhook her and give her peace. In early December of 1990, Nancy Cruzan's feeding tube was unhooked. 
They moved her to the second floor, to the room where she would die. That is the window you were looking at. I know it's this room because the lady who brought me here, she's lived here her whole life, and her father died in the same room Nancy did two months later. Nancy would pass away on December 26, 1990, at the age of 33, after living in a vegetative state for eight years. It was not a peaceful send off for her family. Protesters gathered outside the rehabilitation center where they could be heard in her room. They were chanting all day long, save Nancy, save Nancy. On the 22nd, they actually stormed the building. They had a nurse with them and they tried to get into her room to have this nurse hook her back up. People who thought they knew better than her loving family. People who had never even seen her. I'm so sad for her family to have gone through all of this. Nancy had a lovely funeral. She was buried in a grayish blue coffin, which was laid on a blue shrouded platform. Her family spent private time with her before her service began. Her nieces put private messages in the coffin with her. There were 12 photographs of her throughout her life. Photos of her as a little girl, one where she was riding a bike, one of her as a baby. 200 people attended the service. She was buried in Carterville Cemetery, and I apologize, I went there. And I drove around for two hours trying to find her family's plot, and I could not find it. There were no maps, there was no one to ask, there was no office. It was extremely hot that day. It was 96, I think, probably felt like 105. So I didn't get out and do a whole lot of walking around looking for it, and... I eventually just gave up. Her parents have both passed away. Her father died in 1996 of taking his own life. I would imagine largely from the trauma of going through all of this, there probably were other things as well. Her mother died in 1999 of what I am not sure. Her sister, Chris, died in 2015 of cancer. Her sister Donna is still living, as are her nieces, which is a tragedy for everyone who loved her. But her headstone, I've seen pictures of it, it does say thank you. I am going to include a link to a great interview the family's lawyer gave years later. I think it was filmed in 2006. He gives some really good advice. He says that the best thing to do rather than a living will is to appoint one person and give them power of attorney over your health care decisions. Not a group of people. Pick one. This way you make sure everyone is on the same page, that there won't be infighting like what happened with Terry Schiavo. According to him, a living will would not have helped in Terry Schiavo's case because of the family infighting. So if you give an individual power of attorney over those decisions for you, and you are very specific about your wishes with whoever that person is, then you will avoid any kind of problems like what happened in that case. I remember Terry Schiavo very well. I was only eight years old when Nancy Cruzan passed away, and I did not remember this case at all. My parents did, but I don't. I was just too young to know any different. I lived in a different part of the state at the time. I do have friends from Mount Vernon who have talked about how crazy it was that week, 10, 11 days in which she was passing away. And her lawyer did say he was there, he was in the room. She gave absolutely no reaction whatsoever once her feeding tube was unhooked. She was completely unaware. So it was extremely peaceful. Her family was there. It was peaceful for her. Her family was dealing with the protesters, but she didn't feel anything. While this has been a sad story, I hope it has been a learning experience for those who have stuck with me until the end. Those of you who have done that, thank you so much. I thank everybody who has been supportive of this channel. I would encourage you, if you'd like to see more of this, to please subscribe to my channel. Please like it. Please make comments. Please share it with anyone you think who might benefit from seeing it or enjoy any of my other videos. I really appreciate all of the support. It helps me so much. I will see you all next time.
and I will try to make the next video more uplifting and happy. Everybody take care. I'll see you on our next adventure.